All right. Thank you for joining us today for this month's webinar on Patient Engagement Toolkit for Choosing Wisely. Uh, before we begin, I want to let you know that this uh, webinar is being recorded. Um, I'm Kelly Rand, uh, Program Officer for, the, for Choosing Wisely at the ABIM Foundation. And uh, today's video will feature a conversation between uh, myself and Dr. Lisa Letourneau, the Choosing Wisely Physician Consultant. Uh, and together we're going to guide you through some of the components that we've uh, created to um, do a toolkit on uh, on patient engagement, um, including the international model that we used, how to frame choosing wisely messages, um, and some relevant choosing wisely case studies, both uh, in uh, sort of our everyday use and in our new uh, COVID world. Uh, so I'm going to start the discussion. Uh, with the international model that I, I, I spoke of. So engaging patients in, in care and care redesign takes strategy, evidence, and enthusiasm. And there are additional considerations when engaging patients in reducing unnecessary care, including fear of lack of access to services, the pervasive belief that more care results in better health outcomes. And uh, in this, the U.S. is not alone in this challenge. Um, so through an international collaborate collaboration, uh, Choosing Wisely campaigns around the world, including Canada, the UK, Israel, the Netherlands, and Australia have identified a framework to involve patients in reducing overuse. And the framework's based on the idea of partnering, engaging, informing, and empowering. And as I mentioned, we're going to um, I'm going to do a little context on why we think patient engagement is important, and then we'll dive into each of those topics. So the heart of choosing wisely is grounded deeply in patient safety, we believe. Um, unnecessary care has the potential for harm. Uh, and there's a really terrific article by Deborah Kornstein and, and um, company that maps the negative consequences of overuse. Um, the obvious negative consequence of overuse is physical harm. But in the article, it also talks about how physical harm can uh, cause the risk of cascades of, of care. Um, she also brings up multiple factors which cause additional stress, such as test anxiety, treatment burden. You know, for many individuals, scheduling a test includes figuring out time off from work, who's going to take care of the kids, and how you're going to get there or back. Um, unneeded tests also cause a financial burden. And, and similarly, it can cause a cost cascade. Um, so there may be the cost of the actual, say, imaging, but then you also have to think about the hour that you have to get off work, the um, the cost of the gas that it takes to get there, uh, needing to eat out because two hours of driving plus at least an hour in the medical facility throws off meal times. And we ask patients to take on more and more of these responsibilities for tests and treatments that sometimes have little to no benefit. And by doing that, we further erode the, their trust in the healthcare system. Uh, so one of the best ways to mitigate many of these harms is by engaging patients both at the point of care and systematically. So there's no wrong place to be in the patient engagement spectrum, but the term really does cover a really broad meaning. And our long-term goal is really to facilitate partnership and shared leadership for those patients who are capable and interested. This figure from Health Affairs provides a great overview of the many places that you can be. Um, patients, depending on their health, may also move back and forth on this spectrum, which is why it's important to be inclusive of caregivers in these relationships as well. There are many drivers, we've mentioned some of them, but uh, there are many drivers which may motivate patients to seek tests and treatments which may not be needed. Um, but that said, in both surveys and focus groups, we've heard from patients that they want to be an active participant in their health care care decisions. They understand overuse when examples are provided, and they want information and conversation about making the best decision for themselves and for their family members. We've done focus groups and one of the most enlightening things we've learned is that although patients may not easily categorize experiencing overuse, patients know when something is unnecessary has happened and they, and they really do recognize the harms from that. 
Um, we've also seen a distinct change in many patients with the ACA toward a desire for engagement. However, desire and skills for these conversations are different. A few things we found that help uh, include focusing on safety rather than cost, providing information in plain language, and using written materials to help support what's said. We've also learned that it's helpful for, for patients to hear the message many times, um, and often from different types of sources, whether that's multiple people in the clinic or also from trusted sources such as community or patient groups. So let's dive into the toolkit. Um, Again, I, I mentioned we've broken the tool cut kit into four key elements um, and their partner engagement, inform and empower. And then within those elements, uh, we've uh, d designed it so that you can interact in a, multiple ways. So if you only have five minutes, simply read our five key takeaways. If you have uh, 20 minutes, then we've provided um, newsletter articles, opinion pieces, tables, um, really brief pieces of, of written literature, brief videos, uh, or toolkits where you can only focus on one aspect if you'd like to. And if you're you really jazzed about um, a section, then we've also provided an opportunity to, to really dig into things. So we've provided journal articles, webinars, larger scale implementation strategies, and we've done this for each section. Uh, Lisa and I are going to be trading off on each of these elements uh, and each time we'll provide a case example that highlights each element in action. So I'm going to turn this over to Lisa to start us off with the partner module. Great. Thanks, Kelly. And thanks, uh, folks, for joining us today. Um, as Kelly said, uh, we've been working on identifying resources uh, for this toolkit using the framework. And um, I'm not sure if you said it, Kelly, but you're, I think you're going to show a little screenshot of the toolkit at the end um, of the this webinar as well. And as Kate is pointing out, feel free to um, put questions in the chat uh, as things come up. Uh, so to start the notion, I, I suspect for many folks on the webinar today, um, a lot of these ideas are not new, uh, but the thought is the toolkit can give a very practical um, supports and, and tools and resources, uh, whether it's to you or maybe others in your organization or your practice with whom you're working on this. Um, so to start in that uh, sort of four component framework that Kelly mentioned, the notion of partnering. So really um, nothing um, um, about us without us, right? So reaching out early and often to include patients uh, in the planning process for thinking about how to reduce low value care, particularly understanding that uh, that message can sometimes be misunderstood or um, uh, you know, not necessarily uh, received well if patients don't feel like they've been involved up front, right? The whole notion of trust and making sure that this is being done in a way where patients feel that this is being done um, in their best interest and with their best interest in mind. So thinking about how to invite patients um, early into the planning process and really hearing from them about what matters, right? We might think that it's, um, you know, the classic, right, reducing hemoglobin A1C for somebody with diabetes, but really what they want to be able to talk with you about is how they can um, afford their medications that we're prescribing for them. So um, really thinking about what matters most to patients and uh, in that uh, spectrum of low value care, where to start the focus. Um, making sure that patients have an authentic voice, right? It's not a one-time survey and then, um, you know, going on and doing what we think is necessarily best, but making sure that we're hearing from them and that they have an authentic voice, whether that's having two or three patients in on your improvement team or having ways to get back and communicate with them regularly. Um, and ideally also partnering with community-based organizations because we know that they have a lot of those established relationships. They have trust in their community. They know the people in their community and they know how to communicate with them, uh, particularly in ways that might surpass our one-to-one -one ability to communicate uh, with patients. Um, go ahead. Um, so one example of that that we wanted to pull out is uh, one of my favorites, uh, Baby Boomers for Balanced Healthcare. Um, so um, uh, a group from uh, Minnesota that has really um, uh, taken to heart this notion of working 
uh, directly with patients, with um, members of the community to have conversations about overuse. So um, with that input from members of the community, they developed a process to support small group conversations uh, that includes very practical tools on how to have those conversations. So as whether we're provider organizations or partnering with community organizations, their process includes uh, tools like facilitator orientation for having those conversations, a process guide, handouts for participants using the Choosing Wisely materials, I should have said up front, uh, and even a training video to uh, show how they've done it. Um, I don't have the numbers, Kelly. I don't know if you um, have an estimate, but I, I know they've had many, many of these conversations now um, in different venues with different groups throughout the state, and I think really have uh, developed a great model that is, uh, they make easy for others to use as well. Um, I also don't have the numbers, but I can say that it has been used nationally also. Great. Uh, I had a second uh, example is one more recently from the Rhode Island Quality Institute that has been working um, in partnership with Choosing Wisely and as part of the uh, CMMI Practice Transformation Network and the Support and Alignment Network um, where they um, the identified an, an opportunity to decrease imaging for low back pain, one of the classic uh, markers or opportunities for decreasing overuse, and um, uh, developed decision aid and uh, materials to support conversations uh, in the setting of uh, busy EDs, right? And we know that that's not always a place where it's easy to bring up new topics to take on uh, projects or hard conversations with patients, uh, but by um, talking with patients, developed scripts that staff could use uh, where they could put messages uh, in a way that would be um, maybe better understood by patients, again, in a trusted way, um, talking about sparing you from unnecessary testing, uh, and then engage patients by going back and talking to patients. So called about 100 patients uh, who had been through this process and had not received imaging to, to hear how it was going, to hear how the Choosing Wisely materials and messaging were received and heard, uh, I think, really helpful feedback around that, that reinforced their approach and uh, subsequently saw uh, some important reductions in uh, unnecessary testing for low back pain or imaging, I should say, for low back pain. Uh, and with that, I'm gonna flip it back to you, Kelly, on Engage, go ahead. Great, so uh, I think you're gonna hear some consistent themes in all of these, uh, but when we say Engage, uh, we, we mean involving patient and family advisors really deeply into the implementation and evaluation process. Um, so we're talking about uh, involving patient and family advisors from the beginning, uh, which which Lisa had mentioned, and that helps eliminate healthcare professionals and staff's assumptions about what patients and families might really quote unquote want. Um, studies, as we've mentioned, show that patients want to be more involved in their own healthcare. However, patients may not have the needed competencies to optimize such patient engagement and shared decision making. Uh, so. We uh, have found in the literature that some people have had great success with training patient and family uh, advisors to provide that skill set to, to help them um, help us. Uh, that engaging patients in improving care may help implement uh, processes that improve patient provider communication and thereby reduce the likelihood of delivering unnecessary services and the health risks that can uh, result with it. Um, and using patients as co-leads, we can seek feedback and ask about things like inclusion and power dynamics. Um, and patients and families can be part of a collaborative participatory process rather than you know, asking a survey and maybe checking a box that you've done uh, patient engagement. Um, and validated patient experience surveys are an important part of evalu evaluating your practice, but putting those results into practice is an important way to move past just consulting patients and moving towards genuinely engaging them in the process of implementation and evaluation. Um, the example that we had is uh, at Mainline Health's Riddle Hospital in suburban Philadelphia. Emergency and radiology physicians proposed using RScan, a platform to create and implement projects to reduce unnecessary imaging, to improve uh, appropriate order ordering for CT and geography exams for suspected pulmonary embolisms. 
uh, this was based on the Choosing Wisely recommendation from the American College of Emergency Physicians. The team at Riddle wanted to create a shared decision-making process from the inception, so they reached out to Mainline Health's Office of Patient and Family Engagement to gain input about the development and implementation of a patient engagement component of our scan um, from their PFAC. And you can tell from the quote that's on the um, that's on the screen that uh, the PFAC members felt uh, it was a really successful project. So they suggested enhancements to the RSCAN project uh, and felt that their suggestions helped improve cost effectiveness and supported collaboration between physicians and, and uh, patients in order to get the appropriate care for that patient. So definitely a great case study. Now I'm gonna swing it back to Lisa to inform. <laughs> to inform you about inform. <laughs> so yeah, the next uh, concept in our framework here is uh, really thinking about how we inform patients about uh, low value decisions, about decision making throughout the course of their care. So I think really thinking hard about how we build those conversations into the workflow of practice teams, using all the members of your team, knowing that um, often the frontline staff, uh, right when they're coming in, registration, medical assistance can be an incredibly important uh, part of both the trust relationship in the practice and that conversation about overuse. Um, and remembering to couple conversations about low value care with high value care opportunities, particularly in this time. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about um, the COVID pandemic and how some of these concepts maybe are illustrated through opportunities there. But now when we know that people are not always coming in for high value care, looking for opportunities to um, communicate about both of those. So patients really feel um, uh, the, the caring from the uh, practice team about uh, both ends of that spectrum. Um, and thinking about particularly for from a larger organization, how you use your communications uh, team within the organization maybe to structure and communicate those messages. Um, I think another important part of INFORM is the whole cost conversation. You know, one of the five questions we sometimes um, are not uh, eager to bring that up because of difficulties answering the questions, but I think even asking about the patient's ability to pay for care is uh, a critical part of that and one that people often won't bring up on their own and I think appreciate uh, being asked. Um, and then the issue of what information they use to inform themselves, uh, helping patients understand about what sources of information are trustworthy, how they can use the best information they can access to make their health decisions. And uh, pleased to say we actually have a Choosing Wisely webinar that's gonna be coming up on exactly that topic in that last bullet um, uh, sometime soon. Um, an example uh, that we wanted to highlight from the toolkit about that, go ahead, is from uh, United Community and Family Services, um, where they used a team uh, or really looked at an opportunity to use uh, the team within the practice, multidisciplinary team, um, including physicians, other clinicians, nurses, front uh, office staff, uh, medical assistants, to um, build choosing wisely communications and messaging into the workflow, um, use the materials, uh, uh, shared it through um, uh, posters and brochures, uh, wallet cards, et cetera, really putting it in multiple aspects of the visit uh, so that um, uh, it was visible and an ongoing part of the messaging throughout the visit. And uh, by looking at survey results, we can see both patients and clinicians found several components to be very helpful, particularly the five questions, uh, materials, whether that was posters or otherwise, uh, and really hearing from patients that they felt that uh, they felt comfortable talking about some of these issues with the, with the front office staff. Um, so I think showing us that this uh, messaging and informing can happen in multiple ways and using uh, multiple members of the team to do that. Back to you, Kelly. Great, and so uh, our last uh, in our four segment uh, series is Empower. And um, Empower really is maybe shorthand for supporting the idea of shared decision-making at a clinical level. Uh, so we encourage um, your patient's involvement in the healthcare decision-making process, emphasizing the importance of patient participation for satisfactory patient outcomes. Um, 
use of evidence-based decision aids, uh, assessing current patient knowledge and explaining the spectrum of available treatment options, including uh, benefits and risks. Um, through active listening and open-ended questioning, encouraging patients to discuss which health outcomes and treatment goals he or she prioritizes most, uh, and helping patients generate a decision, uh, allotting additional time if the patient desires it, uh, confirming the final decision with the patient, verifying next steps and scheduling uh, follow-ups and making sure there's a clear uh, care plan and following up with the patient on his or her health status. And if necessary, revisiting the decision with the patient and determining if alternative uh, treatment options should be implemented. And our case study for this is um, uh, the Kansas Healthcare Collaborative. We have highlighted that in a past webinar, maybe a year or so ago. And, and there is a great two page case study write up available in the toolkit that go, delves deeper into this. Uh, but the Kansas Healthcare Collaborative began promoting the five questions, um, both around the office and on checkout materials. Additionally, they asked their clinicians to ask more open ended questions uh, during patient conversations. Um, and these are two pretty simple uh, interventions, but it turns out that um, both by encouraging patients to ask questions and really emphasizing the um, priority of the questions clinicians ask to be open ended and open to listening and giving the time for that listening they really seem to create um, a culture change uh, for a more question friendly experience. And uh, the final results uh, essentially were that both the patients and the clinicians ended most visits feeling more satisfied. Uh, so it's a, you know, a great, a great story of a fairly simple intervention, which uh, really helped to move um, the dialogue patient engagement. So now I'm going to turn it back to Lisa for one more time. <laughs> and we're going to take some of these uh, topics and apply them to COVID-19. Lisa? Great. Thanks, Kelly. And go ahead to the next slide. So um, again, uh, thinking of that, and go ahead, Dur uh, during this pandemic, uh, using that framework that we're talking about um, uh, around patient engagement and how that could be um, used or really is being used uh, by different groups in responding to the COVID-19 pandemic. So first, uh, the concept of partnering, again, thinking about how we can uh, partner with community groups. I think one of the most um, uh, in inspiring and exciting examples, and many of you have probably seen this as well, is partnering with community health workers, uh, people of and from the community who can provide a critical link, uh, who are, understand the culture. And as we know, unfortunately, um, the COVID-19 epidemic has um, unmasked uh, some significant racial ethnic disparities in care uh, and uh, hitting uh, members of those communities, unfortunately, uh, even harder than the general population. So thinking about how community health workers um, can be used as partners to provide information um, into communities that's culturally and linguistically appropriate. Um, their knowledge, using their knowledge of the community resources, whether those are shelters, food pantries, uh, services that can help to support um, isolation and quarantine, to support uh, outreach, to do education around the importance of testing. Um, and then potentially in some communities being used as well to hire and train to do contact tracing. Uh, we um, also are seeing examples of um, partnering with community health workers to do outreach around Medicaid services, whether that's Medicaid enrollment or accessing uh, healthcare services through Medicaid. So I think a really powerful example, again, of uh, what it means to partner in communities to get appropriate care. Um, go ahead. Um, also thinking about uh, engagement. Um, uh, this notion of uh, making sure that we are hearing from and talking with individuals, again, back to the issue of racial ethnic disparities, I think a lot of that comes from distrust of the healthcare system and uh, really is teaching us a very um, uh, painful lesson about the need to involve and engage patients from diverse communities um, up front to better understand what the uh, cultural beliefs, fears, concerns, uh, mistrust might be around accessing, about getting tested, 
um, and uh, thinking about how we get out into the community to build that trust, uh, to work with people to get an appropriate testing, again, understanding social health needs, uh, to support isolation and quarantine when indicated, and thinking ahead um, to uh, how we partner with them to promote successful vaccination immunization strategies, recognizing, again, those same issues of cultural beliefs and mistrust might be um, factoring in to limit um, the success of those. So thinking early and often about how we develop those strategies, uh, communication campaigns, outreach strategies um, with people from the community. Uh, go ahead. Uh, the next, an example of INFORM, we know from, and this is a great example from um, a project out of uh, California looking uh, at emergency uh, visits. We know emergency visits have gone way down. And in this, in this example, they uh, went out into the community to ask people, why, why aren't you coming in and hearing uh, some very um, real and understandable concerns about uh, being exposed, potential exposure to COVID-19. So um, this group developed uh, some simple info infographics and communications that were responsive to the fears being voiced about, uh, will I be safe if I go in? And so um, the communication here you can see is, yes, yes, we will keep you safe. Well, here's why. If you need emergency care, um, you can get that safely in our institution. So talking about the active steps that they were taking to keep people safe um, in that setting. So again, I think a great example of inform. And uh, lastly, um, thinking about empowerment, and this one is specifically choosing wisely example. So uh, bringing the five questions to life related to COVID-19, um, uh, some examples of um, translating the five questions. So, so again, you know, do I need this testing procedure? What are the risks? Are there simpler, safer options? What happens if I do nothing? And what about uh, costs? And this one uh, talking about the costs of uh, medication, some of which are uh, less... <laughs> Uh, maybe known to be less effective than when this was first developed, but um, uh, uh, you know, showing how those questions can be applied uh, in the setting of COVID-19. Um, so with that, I think that brings us through the uh, walkthrough of this framework and wanted to uh, turn this now to Kate Carmody, who's our uh, third important partner in uh, developing this toolkit. And I think, uh, Kelly, we're going to look to Kate to do a little demo of the toolkit online. Kate? Hi, everyone. I'm going to share my screen with you. So this is how you can access the toolkit online. So the first step would be going to the Choosing Wisely website. Then from here, you can click on Getting Started. And on the right hand side here where there's a couple different options, you'll click on implementation toolkits. And if you scroll down to the bottom here, you'll see patient engagement and low value care. And I'll click through to give you an example. So these are the buckets that we had talked about today. If you click on engage, it hyperlinks to this page and you can scroll through all the way down and do the same with the other sections such as inform and empower. Uh, Kate, can you can you just go back to that one second? I just was going to ask you to show the, um, as Kelly noted, the sort of five minute, uh, what do we say, 20 or 30 minute an hour or so, kind of the small, medium and, and uh, larger. <laughs> sure, the engage page. Oh, any any one of them. So okay. There we go. So five minutes is the five things to consider for each one of the sections. 20 minutes, there we go. So links to tools that might take longer and then hour, an hour, uh, whether they're um, published studies, uh, videos, webinars uh, that again relate to each component of the toolkit. Great. Thank you. So Kelly, back to you. Well, I guess at this point, I uh, would love to answer any questions that um, people have about the toolkit itself, possibly using it, um, the research behind it. Uh, 
really, really anything you'd like to talk about, we're happy to talk about. But maybe I'll start off and ask my, um, one of my co-creators here as a physician, um, how do you think that you would share this type of toolkit in, uh, with, the, with the people that you work with, uh, Lisa? Yeah, well, I think, you know, um, one of the both opportunities and challenges right now uh, is the pandemic, right? And we know that people aren't working quite in the same way that they were. Um, we know that there are, on the one hand, whole new you know, ideas and challenges that we're facing. And on the other hand, uh, we've had a slowdown in most ambulatory practices that while it has come back up, I think I've heard often that, um, you know, ambulatory practices are maybe still at 70 to 80% of capacity. So uh, I might think about, gosh, are there opportunities right now to um, use some of that, um, I don't know, open sounds too open, but <laughs> some <laughs> opportunities for conversations um, with staff. I know, you know, this a combination of people working remotely, people working in the practice, but to the extent that there are still opportunities to have all staff meetings, uh, you know, bringing this up as an opportunity for um, setting up new projects, revisiting old projects, um, thinking about the notion of uh, COVID and you know, what we just talked about now as um, one way to think about that framework for patient engagement and uh, you know, what's happening in the context um, of COVID that could provide an opportunity to think through these uh, partner, engage, inform, you know, et cetera. Um, that said, I know every community looks different, every practice looks different, and love to hear from folks on the, on the webinar if anybody has thoughts about um, opportunities to do that, oh, where things are in terms of bandwidth to uh, either revisit past practices um, around choosing wisely and low value care, maybe new ones that have come up in the last months here as we've been walking through this strange time that we're in. Really encourage it. I put up the slide too. <laughs> we would love to hear from you. We're, we're glad so many people were able to join us on a, at least in Philadelphia, very hot July afternoon. And you are welcome to um, both unmute yourself and ask a question aloud or to uh, enter a question into chat. Um, hi, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, hi, this is Karin Larson Pollock. I'm the Chief Quality and Analytics Officer at Providence in Everett, Washington. And my question for you is I'm, I'm struggling with the the slide that said, uh, feel free to ask your patients if they can pay for something. And I'm just curious about how that conversation goes and if there's any sort of legal or ethical or other implications in, in asking that. So could you speak a little bit more to that, please? Do you want to start or do you want me to go? Um, I, yeah, I'll, I'll jump in uh, first. Well, you know, I, I, I would argue, and I think, you know, there have been, um, Whole groups developed around this that that we have really an ethical obligation to ask and I, and I, I don't mean to say that um, you know we should curtail or, or deny care if people say they can't afford something but you know that's been suggested right uh, uh, talking to patients about costs is the fifth vital sign that that if we don't ask if we don't and, and I think again surveys have shown that people do appreciate um, bringing it up because they often feel awkward or um, too proud or whatever to bring it up themselves, but they appreciate when it is asked uh, because I think it can shape um, decisions about what's uh, the best route for them uh, if they say outright, I mean, we, we'd rather know, right? <laughs> if, if we're recommending whether it's a treatment, a, a imaging procedure, a, a referral, and they know in their head that when they walk out, they're not gonna do it because they can't afford it. it it's a better conversation in the room than not knowing um, you know, what's gonna happen outside of the room. So I think being able to adjust and, and have that conversation, well, what if I don't do it? You know, are, there, are there less expensive alternatives? Um, the, the whole five questions, right? What happens if I do nothing? It can provide opportunities for conversation that provide a, a better, a more realistic path, which is uh, therefore, you know, the better path for them. Um, 
but I, I'd love to hear more about your concerns about that. Uh, I don't know, uh, or, or Kelly, do you want to jump in with other thoughts? Just there? one other thing to add is uh, one, we have put a few uh, tools to help people with cost conversations, but um, we are also making this recommendation with the full understanding that you may not know what the cost is, even if you have a cost discussion, but that the discussion really is opening that line of communication. And you may not know that it's too costly in the point of care, um, but by talking about it, if say, for example, your patient goes to the pharmacy and they're the prescribed medication is hundreds of dollars and they have to make the choice between, you know, I, I don't know, um, food and that medication, that because that conversation is open, they can call back and you've said, you know, we'll work on something. And maybe that there is a second alternative that would be more effective than doing nothing. Um, which would be what they would ha what would happen if they went, it was hundreds of dollars and they just decided not to fill that prescription because um, they didn't expect that and they couldn't handle it when it, um, or they can't, they can't budget that in to their expectation for now. So uh, a lot of the resources that we have are really talking about, again, sort of that shared decision-making and how to have a conversation about how there may be alternate plans and that's okay. Um, so I, I think that we hope you'll check out the resources that we have, um, but I agree with Lisa that it's an important question uh, that really has a lot more to do with helping people follow their care plan in a, in a way that doesn't hurt them in a, in a different aspect. Maybe not their physical health, but their financial health. Do you, um, do you want to say more about um, specific concerns that you have or, or you know, fears of, of doing the conversation wrong or, or you know, violating any kind of ethical considerations? Yeah, no, I'll actually look at your resources. It's just something that's come up here as folks talk about, number one, I, I'm glad you addressed the fact that sometimes we don't know what the cost is uh, for the patient. So how do you have a, a, a sort of a conversation around something that you're not quite sure what it would be. But number two is really around just there's a reticence um, just around to have that conversation. So how can you? So I think scripting will be important for folks mm -hmm. to be able to roll this out. Because I agree. I think it's absolutely critical. And I, I think we need to address it. But but how to do it, I think folks struggle with. Mm -hmm. So I'll be interested to see what tools or scripting you have. Yeah. And I think even on the, you know, hard to know what the costs are. I, I certainly would agree with that. It's very difficult, but at least an order of magnitude, right? I mean, we know that an MRI costs a lot more than a low back film or, or costs a lot more than physical therapy, uh, right? So at least being able to have that um, even, even, you know, general rough costs, um, I think uh, can be helpful for patients. Agreed. Thank you. And if you want to look at a tool in particular, the um, right question, wrong person toolkit rounds up a lot of different tools. And I believe one of the authors is on as a participant today, Dr. Susan Perez. Susan, do you want to add anything to that? She was at least in the beginning. Oh. <laughs> Other questions and comments. Great, great uh, conversation, and one I think we are all still struggling with um, on that transparency part. And again, feel free to unmute yourself uh, or add things to the chat. And if they are in the chat, Lisa and Kate, I will rely on you since I'm sharing and I can't really see the chat at this time. I'm not seeing anything new. But... Other thoughts about, back to Kelly's question, to me, how anybody could envision maybe using the toolkit, how it could be helpful, how we could make it more helpful. It's a great point, Lisa. We're always uh, happy to continue to evolve these tools. Um, so if it is something that you use and you have feedback for us, um, you know, feel free to email um, Kate, who's always uh, has her 
freely gives her email at the end of these webinars or through info at choosing wisely because um, we'd love to hear your feedback uh, whether it's um, supportive or oppositional uh, both are helpful <laughs> and uh, we'll be happy to be reactive to both Kate. Any areas of patient engagement that we didn't talk about that people are challenged by, struggling with um, in COVID times or otherwise? I will say the one thing that Lisa gave a, a slight teaser for, um, but that will have quite a bit more information than it is in the, the current um, toolkit um, after next month's webinar is that we are focusing on the clinical conversation and how to deal with misinformation. Um, so next month uh, on the third Tuesday at four o'clock Eastern, Brian Southwell We'll be uh, talking about a uh, series of re research that he's done on how clinicians can have better conversations um, on misinformation, even though there is a world of interesting things out there. Um, but what to say to your patient when they come and tell you that they're curing their cancer with essential oils. Otherwise known as responding to Dr. Google, I think is how it is. <laughs> I think I've got the August 18, right, Kelly? Tuesday, August 18. That is, that is the third eight, Tuesday, if that sounds right. But that is an area we're looking forward to growing. We've gotten, it looks like several chats have said that there are no presentations. Um, so I don't want to extend it if we don't, <laughs> uh, or there's no questions. There was a presentation. <laughs> the end of the day. <laughs> um, but uh, one more call for comments, questions, feelings, thoughts, and then I guess we will probably give you back 10 to 15 minutes. But feel free to add in a last thought before we uh, close this out. Looks like we're good. Okay, well, I want to say thank you to everybody for attending today. Uh, again, great uh, participation for uh, a hot July day. And I also want to thank um, my colleagues here, Lisa and Kate, for helping with the webinar and also creating um, such a good toolkit. So thank you for everything that you've done. And uh, we'll see you next month again to talk about misinformation. Thanks everybody for showing up. <laughs>